All right, guys, welcome to Practical Shooting After Dark. My name's Ben, and we're here to talk about practical shooting and, and say salty words sometimes. I think it's a good thing. Uh, oh, shit, did we lose Hopkins? No, he's there. All right, no, I'm back today, Mr. Matt. No, I'm here. All right, now I see you. You're there. Hi. And Mr. Chris. <laughs> Hello. Mr. Kim. I'm here. All right. <laughs> All right, you guys know the rules. Everybody comes here with the topic. You bring an item to show and tell and describe for the uh, audio rip listeners. Uh, you talk about what you did this week in shooting, which hopefully will be something interesting. Or talk about some of the triggers you, something that pisses you off, something you don't like. Mr. Kim, you want to go first? Yes, I would love to. Right. So I was in uh, Czech Republic shooting Extreme Euro Open, and... Uh, in my squad, there was one of the guy who's uh, part of this company developing a new pistol called Alien. And this is pretty brand new design. So basically, if you look at the slide, the barrels, conventionally barrels on top and underneath the barrel, there's a guide rod and the recoil spring. But this gun, the barrel is where the recoil spring is going to be. And then recoil spring is on top of the barrel. So basically the barrels lower than the conventional guns. And when I actually grip the gun, uh, my top of my hand, so the web of my hand, is actually higher than the barrel. So there is no bore axis. So uh, there is basically no leverage. And there is not much flip when I shoot it. I shot both iron sight and the red dot. And when I shot the red dot, the dot behaved as if I was shooting an open gun with a compensator. And also, they separated the slide into two different pieces. So they have the side panels and the top of the slide separated. So you can easily just take the top off and switch it from iron side to red dot in like 10 seconds or whatever number. And then uh, also benefit of that is when you shoot iron sight, it's like the island thing. So the front sight or the red dot doesn't reciprocate. So it does move when the cycle slide, uh, slide back and forth. And then also the slide is way thin, I think. And also the slide weight, the reciprocating mass is now way lighter. So the recoil uh, feels way lighter as well. And basically there's not much flip at all. And the weight was, it's all steel gun. It's not, uh, if I remember correctly, it's about 38 ounce or something like that. And also the grip felt uh, similar to Glock or Striker one. So it was a little bit higher grip. And I really liked it when I shoot it. But I heard uh, it's going to be a little pricey. And also, uh, in terms of shooting, it was very easy to shoot, but it was kicking me back straight really hard instead of flipping up and down. So that was really good, but I heard, um, so when I shot about 70 rounds, I had some issues with fitting. I think it's because the slide is too light and maybe recoil spring was light. So I think getting the gun reliable is their test to make it really good gun. But generally, it's a very brand new design, I think. The recoil is way less, or the side, side going up and down is way less. So I think people will love it. That sounds pretty interesting, actually. But you mm -hmm. didn't, yeah. um, you didn't, you preferred, would you, would you prefer that to what you have now? Uh, not necessarily. I think uh, I can do pretty much same thing with conventional gun that this can, this gun can do, but. I think it, it has to be a heavy gun, though. If I'm shooting lighter, uh, lighter weight gun, plastic guns, I think this gun is way flatter, and uh, I can shoot faster and accurate. But if you are comparing to like 45 ounce guns, I I don't think there's a whole lot of difference, to be honest. Hmm. Okay. So um, this gun was only in Europe right now, right? Yeah, this for, gun... It's, you can't buy it yet, right? No, no, no. They said they only have prototypes right now. And they said they're going to start manufacturing in nine, 2019 in the U.S. 
and the company is called Laogo Arms in Czech Republic. Yeah. Yeah, I think they're, one thing they're I heard about Facebook. it. Yeah, the developer is is who also developed Evo Scorpion rifle, and I heard he used to work for CC and then got his own company now. So he's pretty smart. Yep. Okay. It's, it's an, I mean, it's early yet. We'll see. We'll see what happens, right? Yep. All right. Matt, what do you got? So I have a trigger warning this week. You're triggered. You're angry. Yeah. I love it. So to follow up on my last topic, it was about Ipsic Nationals. This is a strictly about popper colors and what color we should make poppers when we shoot matches. I think blue. Really sucks I think off blue, my eyes. I think blue's the worst color to make. Oh, shit. Besides black, maybe. Well, I think it's the best. <laughs> no. I think it's... I, so, from my experience in shooting them, it makes it hard to see them when there's, like, sun over the bay, over the top of them, and they're in the shade. I don't know why they choose to use blue poppers at this range, but they did it ever since the world shoot back in 2014. They've always had blue poppers there. I think they might have bought so much blue paint that they're going to have blue Come poppers on. It's, there for a while. It's, it's, it's been four years. I understand. There's no reason. No, I think this is something the USPSA should step in on and maybe do a ruling on. Because they have a ruling rules on like... Yeah. It, it's just a... Yeah. An adjustment. <laughs> <laughs> We're not <laughs> changing the rules, man. We're just adjusting them. Right, Exactly. Okay. No, but I it makes it super hard for iron sight guns because we have black sights. I don't know of anybody that uses any different color on an iron sight gun to see the poppers and have any kind of contrast on the poppers if they're in the shade on a bay. So the poppers are dark blue, you have black sights, and if they're in the shade, you basically have no contrast on them. But do you want to know the worst part about this, Matt? No one sees it as an issue. No, no. I think a lot of people are annoyed by blue poppers. But yeah. I, I mean, you know me, I travel a lot. There's a lot of ranges I go to, especially internationally, yeah. where it's like they saw, like they see the Florida World Shoot, and it's like, oh, blue poppers. So they're like, fuck, man, the poppers are going to be blue now. We got to train on blue poppers. So guess what color paint they buy? Blue. Yes. And then, then you're like, fuck. <laughs> so there's what? blue poppers everywhere. Why can't like it'd be super simple to mandate a rule like all poppers are white. We yeah, have that white nose shoots and white simple. poppers. That would be simple. Like it's not that hard. Area three had like tan colored they, poppers they a tan year colored ago poppers. or whatever. Yeah. Like, they they do that every year. Berms. That's Sherwin's thing. He loves that shit. Uh, that's a pain in it's the a, ass too. It's the same it's the same issue. But he says it's simpler. It's like, no, it's simple. You just shoot all the brown stuff. You're like, okay. So the, <laughs> there's only one good thing about tan poppers. You have some contrast when your sights get on them, actually. A little bit, yeah. So it, it's better than, like, blue on black. It's tan on black. So that's a good thing about the tan ones. But you still have some indistinguishable features when they're, like, against a dirt back berm or whatever. Yeah. No, the, the blue poppers are quite annoying. Yeah. And it's no, like... I, it's not, I mean, I wouldn't bitch if they got rid of the blue poppers. Don't get, don't get me wrong, but it's like, it's way worse than just that range. There's a lot of, there's a lot of places where they, they, as soon as they saw blue, they're like, that color sucks to shoot at. I think we'll buy blue from now on. That's horrible. Like, oh. that's such an easy thing to mandate or whatever. They don't even have to mandate it. Like, just match directors, like, know that it sucks for certain shooters in certain light conditions that there's no reason to have it. It doesn't add anything to the match to match um, up the fault lines with that are red and the shoot targets are white. And then, so they need something blue. They make the poppers blue. Yeah. I don't to have yeah. red, white, blue. That was supposedly one of the reasons they did that at the world shoot. Oh my God. <laughs> okay. That's my trigger warning. I think it should be changed. I, it shouldn't probably need a rule. It should just be match directors knowing that 
that sucks and it's not fair Blue for everybody. Dumb. Yeah. And just change it. Blue is pretty dumb. All right. I got to show and tell. I hold in my little hands a shadow too. Right, Matt? <laughs> I actually can't see it. My screen's frozen on you, but I trust you. Yeah. <laughs> you shouldn't trust me. I, I'm not. What do you have? Me. I have a, a, a Tampolio stock three. Ah. All right. So uh, I got a, you know, I got a, I got a pair of these, uh, his and hers, as it were, a set of these, and probably. Kim, what do you think the question is? Why would I have this? Is that because the sexier gun? That would be. <laughs> and you want to be sexier? That would be one theory. Yes. If I yes. have a, a I have a stable of stock twos, but hey, so I need a sexier gun. So yes, that could be one thing. Chris, do you have an alternative theory? Uh, Ipsic Nationals. No. I don't know. <laughs> well, actually, kind of. Ipsic Nationals, yes. I do have these for Ipsic Nationals, but not in this country. Australia? Australia, yeah. So uh, the law so, in Australia yeah. precludes me from bringing a gun with a barrel shorter than 120 millimeters into the country. My stock two is best as I can tell are 118 millimeters. Now, last time I went through customs in Australia, uh, they didn't fuck with me on the, uh, on the length of my barrels. I didn't bring stock twos. I brought five inch guns, but they're not. I brought production, like guns that are not production legal. I brought just to have guns to shoot. And I just shot standard with minor, which was fine. But I want to shoot production at the Australian Nationals the next time they have it. So that meant getting production guns that I can legally bring across the border into Australia. And the easiest option for me is the stock threes. Okay, so that's why I have these. And um, my, my man Derek did the trigger on these. Practically perfect performance. I have to mention him because he, uh, you know, he did a good job, and I'm kind of a dick to him. Uh, so, yeah, he did the trigger on these. IPSC legal, of course. Just uh, swapped in a couple parts. But, uh, yeah, um, shooting these. What, what are these? These are like 30 bucks cheaper than the stock twos, right, Matt? Do you know? I literally have no idea how much they cost. I didn't a, even know we had those in the U.S. I stock didn't. threes? Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're a thing. Um, ba basically, the difference is um, from a stock two is it's a half inch longer. But, you know, it's a little bit, it's like a, a five inch gun as opposed to four and a half or whatever the other one is. Um, yeah. No bull barrel. I think that's why they charge less money for this. And, uh, and to get, make the weight and balance similar, they just add the light rail. So um, it looks kind of like a shadow. Okay, so that's why I got these. Um, a few people might wonder why I don't have the stock to Australian versions, which is a fair question. Uh, those are not, I mean, I could get them if I wanted them, I'm sure, but it's like, why? The stock threes are far more readily available to me and it doesn't, you know, and functionally they're really similar. So they, I don't. See why I'd get the stock two Australians. Are, are those are the uh, stock two Aussies? Are they all uh, small frame? Kim, you might know this. I think they are. Yeah, I think Australia is mostly Aust small Australia frame. is mostly small frame. That is true. Mm -hmm. But I honestly, think that's probably stock... just a barrel difference, and they could probably just send you an extended barrel for your current guns. Well, they could, or I could get entirely new guns and have more guns. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stock three, fifty dollars cheaper. Wow. It's fifty dollars cheaper. Yes, if you're if you're in the market, it uses a so it uses a different holster than the stock twos, which is annoying to me a little bit because I need to get di I had well I had to get different holsters, so it's a little annoying. Not too bad. Uh, if the recoil impulse feels a little different, I would say, just being a little longer, the slide it feels a little a little different to shoot, but not a lot. The trigger, the grip, all that shit's the same. And uh, if you're uh, listening, you didn't. You, you know, listening to the auto rip, I have red grips on mine because I've taken to the Henning grips. I really have. Um, his full checkered grips are about right for me. They're, they're they're very nice, and I like Henning. So I had a bunch of guns come in, and I uh, got in touch with Henning. I'm like, Henning, I need some of your full checkered grips. What do you got for colors? I like black, like Batman. And he's like, I can't do black, but I can do red. And I'm like, fuck. Okay, <laughs> red. And I actually kind of like the look of it. It doesn't look bad. I shouldn't complain about it. It looks fine. It looks nice. It's 
classy. So anyway, that's that's what I got. So for Australian nationals, I'm ready. I got I got my guns. Have some time with them to shoot them. It's going to be good. Looking forward to it. I tried a couple different CZ grips. I find Henning also the best fit and best looking. Well, Henning has a few options, right? Like uh, he has the the full checkered for the Tanfos, the half checkered. Um, yeah. Yeah, like he's got them for Tangfo and CZ. I was just up to his shop actually a couple I, weeks I ago. I think the profile's different on the CZ ones. Yeah, is it is a little bit. Uh, yeah, I I use caliper to check the dimension. CZ was one point three or something, and Tangfo was one point two something like that. Yeah, uh, the deal with the grips is you got to get the ones that fit that work for your hands and fit your hands. For the Tanfos, the the Grafell, the EGD grips are the thin ones. Then there's um, Hennings are a little thicker. Uh, the factory wood are the thickest. The Patriot Defense ones are kind of a goofy shape, but they're pretty thick too. So you just got to get the right thing for your hands or what works for you. I don't. I'm not telling everybody to buy Henning grips for sure. Just like get the ones that fit your hands. I like the Henning grips. They're pretty easy to recommend to people for you know males with average sized hands. Like the the Henning grips are pretty good, it seems, on the the shadows and the stock twos. Is that fair to say, guys? Yep, I agree. Yeah. That's that's what I used to. Yeah. That and I like Henning. Henning's cool, dude. Henning's a good guy. I like I genuinely like Henning as a person. I don't know him all that well, but I genuinely like him. Okay, um, Mr. Chris, what do you got up? All right, so I got these new. It's probably backwards in the camera, but oh they're called God. Halo Sport. <laughs> I decided to try them out because I saw them all over Face Blog and and whatever. Mm. So they have these little, I don't know, rubber dildos all over them <laughs> that you soak in water. And you they're see some connected. strange looking dildos, my friend. <laughs> you actually so soak you, them in water? Yeah. Well, you, they pop out, so you can you can kind of pop them out, and then they have these little electrical connections. All on right them. for the for the audio rip listeners. Chris is holding an object that looks like it looks like a he, like a headphones, like a Beats like, by Doctor Dre. Yeah, they're like yeah. Beats by Dre headphones, except for you soak these little detachable pads uh, that comes with them, and then you put them across your uh, motor cortex. It runs from ear to ear across your head, and it basically runs like a light electrical current through it. And so, what it does is what Sounds they say. Sounds like a good idea already. Yeah. Well, it's it's not bad. It just feels like I don't even know what it feels like. It's not like you're getting electrocuted or anything. It's just like a slight tingling. And uh basically it charges your brain and your motor cortex to work better and have your muscles work better with your movements and stuff. So, I actually got these really cheap. Wait, so that's I the sales try pitch. Them Does that actually work? Uh so I've used them for like five or six dry fire sessions now. Um, I don't know if it's because I'm practicing more or not, but I'm beating all my par times and I'm lowering them. And it feels like when I come back and do it again, like I remember it better, I guess. I don't know. I, I really don't have anything measurable to say whether they work or not. Um, they have a money back guarantee on them. So I figured I'd try them out. And if I hated them, you know, I'd send them back. How much if are these they, things? Uh, let me look on their I'm on their website right now. Um, I believe it's like seven hundred dollars ish. Yeah, I didn't pay that. I, I wouldn't have bought them if it was that much. So right now they're listed at five ninety nine. Um, I actually had a discount code, so I think I got them for like two ninety nine. Uh, and it, I just, you know, I was like, dude, I blow so much more than that on other things. Getting into this sport, gear and finding out holsters that I wanted and mag pouches, and you know, we just talked about Henning grips alone. I've probably spent. 600 bucks on grips finding the ones i like and you know i sold the other ones off but these things i figured hey if it works you know it's a good investment and if not i'll just send them back um i don't know if it's placebo or not but it seems to be that they're working now so I, we'll see i'll keep using them and see you know i guess there's really no way to to measure i don't know you're the, you're the first not, person but. you're the first person without financial interest in this giving me their opinion yeah, I have zero financial interest. I so paid for them. I, I, don't, am, I am of interest to hear what you have to say. 
Yeah, I mean, they've they've been working so far. I just got a care package in the mail like two days ago. Hey, thanks for trying these out. Whatever, here's some more. Uh, I think they call them, I don't know what the hell they're called, the little Dildos? dildo things. Yeah, here's a free pack of dildo replacements for when your other ones wear out. Thanks for, for giving us a shot, basically. So customer service seems good. Uh, you know, I don't know. So far, they seem to be working. You can also hook them up to your phone so you can listen to music, so you can take them into the gym and work out with them and stuff. Um, so you're to wear them while you do the training? So there's two there's two ways to do it. You can wear them. It's it's like a 20-minute session that it, it like, shocks your noggin, if you will. And uh, you get a pr- – it's like a primer. So the, the 20 minutes is like for a primer, and you can start working out then or you can start warming up then, they say. It's, it's like it's okay to, to warm up or whatever. And then you have an hour after you use it for the 20 minutes where that, that motor cortex is stimulated and you get the maximum benefit from it. So essentially you have an hour and 20 minutes to, to do whatever. So I've seen people wear them at the gym. Well, I haven't seen them in person, but, you know, on like reviews and stuff, people, people wear them in the gym. People tell you that. Yeah, well, no, I haven't talked to you about <laughs> paid to use them, but um, I just use them before I dry fire, and then I take them off so I can hear the buzzer and stuff, obviously. But it came with like a free little connection, so I can hook it up to the Bluetooth on my phone if I want to wear them in the gym, and I can listen to music and work out at the same time and stuff. So, okay. I got a question. So if you go to the match, do you have to activate those dildos before you shoot? I always activate my dildos first, Swansig. Okay. <laughs> um, so it's, That's a good idea. It's more used for training, not actually at the match. Okay. So like when you're building your myelin and you know muscle memory or whatever you call it, you're using it then to get the greatest benefit out of your training. And then I guess you could use it before the match to get maximum effectiveness, but I mean it's not gonna drown out gunshots. Like they're not soundproof or anything. So I mean I guess you could wear your plugs and then wear those over your plugs. Uh, and still stimulate yourself, but the problem is like you got to keep the little electrodes wet, and if it's ninety five degrees out and you're at a match, it's probably not going to work. I think they'll stay so wet they have if to, it's ninety five degrees out. You know what I mean? Do they have to be wet to use them? Yeah, it comes with like a little spray bottle because that's how the electricity is conducted is through these little okay. electrodes. So it says you can either soak them for fifteen seconds before you use it, or it comes with just like a little spray bottle. You just take them out and spray them and get them all wet, and then. Uh, you have a, it, it like runs off an app on your phone, and so it'll tell you if it has a good connection with your skin or not. You kind of have to like wiggle them on your head to get them exactly right, and then once it right, it's right, the thing runs. You're aware of how preposterous this whole thing sounds, right? <laughs> well, you know, it, it sounded crazy, but I've, I used to work for some Navy SEALs when I ran a range, and one of their friends used to shock his motor cortex with something like a lot more barbaric than these things. And he swears <laughs> up and down that it worked for him when he was going on missions and stuff. So it's not the first time that I've heard it. And I'm not saying that it's it's right or wrong or not, but you know, I figured, hey, I'll give it a shot. If it works, awesome. If it doesn't, then I'll send him back. I've done some looking into this. I've heard that something like this level, this is totally just what I've read, whatever. You can take it as a... I've, yeah, I've read the voltage level's too low or whatever. Exactly, yeah, I've heard it, low. yeah. It's not big enough to actually cause anything. I'll probably I've heard the brain tumor is what'll happen. <laughs> <laughs> or it'll fix one that you currently have. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> I don't know if that's how you I've, treat tumors. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard there's some bigger ones like that are like kind of industrial size or whatever that wouldn't like just fit on your head all in one unit. That are sort of legit, though. Yeah, I've seen the ones with, like, the little electrodes that, like, stick. You know, you stick it to your head or whatever, yeah. and then it's run by, like, a... It's almost like a TENS machine, and then you shock your head with it. But I didn't, I didn't really feel like going that crazy or anything. I just figured, hey, <laughs> I'll give it a try. Why not? No, well, it sounds interesting. Uh, you got to keep us updated on this, obviously. Yeah, I'll let you know, and if I stop answering the Skype calls, you'll know what happened. <laughs> what, Brain what tumor? happened? Shorted out and electrocuted me or something. <laughs> Jesus. All right. Let's move on to some questions. All right. The guy has a bunch of IPSC questions. He says, these questions will pertain to everyone on your podcast. I don't know about that. We have Chris here. We, Chris, you're not an IPSC shooter, are you? No, I haven't shot it. Yeah, okay. But you can, you can keep us honest. Make sure we answer these questions to your satisfaction. Okay, number one, 
when you have an IPSC match coming up, do you shoot limited minor 15 rounds per mag? Um, or just stick with USPSA production 10 round rules? Just to hook quick uh, round table. Hopkins, what do you do? USPSA production rules five rounds doesn't change much. Kim? I shoot 10 rounds. I shoot 10 rounds also. Like, I, uh, I, I think I mentioned this in a prior podcast. People make way too much of this five, this five round extra thing. It's not that big of a deal. And going to a match and shooting 15 rounds at the match, like that doesn't really help me prepare. It doesn't really help me because I'm going to shoot five or six stages at a club match. Maybe it'll change where a few reloads are, or I'll do a couple less reloads or something. Like it doesn't make any difference in training. Yeah, I'll shoot 15 round mags just to get used to the Pick magazines gunlight. being a little heavier. That's all. Yeah. I mean, they drop out easier and stuff like that if they're full, but yeah. you're usually shooting them like one or two, just like you're shooting a 10 round. Yeah, like that so. shooting 15. I, Sorry for those who've done it. I think shooting limited minor with 15 rounds to prep for IPSC is stupid. It doesn't make any sense to me. All right. I don't think there's any weight gain, like gain or anything like no, that. No, but I know a few guys have done it, and I don't, I don't know they're doing it to make a point, or I don't, I don't get it. It doesn't really matter. All right. <laughs> Do you incorporate IPSC targets into your training leading up to an IPSC match? I'll say yes, but also not leading up to an IPSC match. I will incorporate those in. What about you, Kim? I, uh, I would say this year I shot IPSC target in my training probably seventy percent of the targets were IPSC targets. Uh, even like six months before, so I don't, I don't purposefully shoot IPSC target because I'm prepared. I shoot IPSC target in general. Okay. Same answer for me. I've switched over to those, buying those exclusively. I only have some leftover headed targets just because they're leftover. Yeah, I have a few targets with heads, but I use them typically if I want to set up a specific, like, scenario or something with them. I don't really yeah. give a fuck which target so use. Okay, do you think it's counterproductive to shoot local USPSA hoser type matches prior to an IPSC match since IPSC is heavy on accuracy? Hmm. I don't think so. I think shooting a match is shooting a match. Shoot a match mm -hmm. shoot a match. What about you, Mr. Kim? I agree with Matt. I agree with Matt too. Shooting a match is shooting a match. <laughs> like, no, it's not fucking detrimental. There are hoser stages in IPSC as well. Just mm -hmm. saying, guys. Yep. That is also a thing that happens. Number four. In international matches around kind of let's say 500 for the match what's your determining factor on how many rounds you will bring minus a shoot off i'll tell you as much oh, as i uh, i'll bring you know half again as much as i think i need and i don't give a fuck about bringing stuff for the shoot off <laughs> what about you matt uh, as much as i can sneak on the airline <laughs> and mr kim <laughs> uh i usually do like plus 200 from the round count at the match of the match all right. Uh, number five this is the last one in this series. With a short three-minute walkthrough for major IPSC matches, do you and your squad mates exchange ideas, or do you just keep to yourself and not share your thoughts on that particular stage? Matt, we've squatted together at IPSC matches. What do you think? Well, we definitely all talk about it, especially if... So, difference between U.S. and international ones. International ones, you're not taping, so you can actually go over and see the stages run. At the U.S. ones, you're taping it and everything, so it's kind of harder to get, sneak away and go see like how the stage is being run or whatever, or different plans. So, yeah, we definitely talk in between and share plans and everything. It's easier international because you're not required to help reset the stage. Yeah. Hmm. Well, yep. what I would say is the team element is real. So uh, uh, practical shooting is not typically a team sport, but when we have a, a, like four Americans on a team – uh, shoot like the production teams squad together and the open team squad together. I mean, I've been on the team a few times. So when I'm on a team of other American guys uh, shooting uh, a world shoot and it's like, okay, there's four guys from this country and four guys from that country and four guys from that country over there. And we're the American guys shooting. Like we are, we do work together as a team to shoot the stages the best we can. You know, it's not, it's not really productive for us to withhold from each other or fuck around with each other. Uh, yeah, we all want to do well individually, but, I mean, the, the only help is coming from guys on your team. So you, you want to be helpful. I find talking about stage playing is, is usually very beneficial 
sometimes I find uh, I should I double engage target and miss one target kind of situation last year at the shoot and I, I was talking to my friend and he was going over it was like I realized oh I'm double engaging or oh that's actually more efficient route so I, I usually talk about it all the time yeah okay now we can move on to a different question I guess this one's for me. <laughs> hey, Ben, I've noticed in your more recent videos you post of your shooting drills that your footwork is way faster than it used to be, especially over longer distances. Are there any specific exercises you found to be the most helpful with foot speed? Are you doing any leg exercises? Kim, this question, you just take mm -hmm. it, man. <laughs> you know what to do. <laughs> yeah, so when uh, second year of my shooting, I started focusing on the foot speed, but then uh, – I hired a physical trainer and he was a rugby player. And then I started realizing actually the foot speed itself is not everything. Uh, so basically, even if you move your feet very fast, if you are not uh, moving efficiently, uh, it's not going to be very fast compared to, let's, uh, I'll give you an example, sprinting style running versus, um, let's say, soccer style running. Soccer style running and sprinting style running is very different. Uh, of course, soccer style running, very fast, agile, very quick turns. But sprinting style, their pace is longer, but they can exert greater amount of force. So I actually approach differently, depends on how, many, how much distance I have to cover. So if I am just running straight, uh, maybe seven, eight steps, something like that, then I would try to uh, run like a sprinter, basically. And if I am moving shorter step, I'm going to try to move a little bit more like a soccer player or rugby player, something like that. And what really helped me was actually um, making my body in one line, straight line. So if I draw a line from my head to my foot, if my knee was bent or if my uh, upper body was too bent, so if it's a crooked line, the force that I can generate to run fast is not very efficient. And also, it can hurt my body. Actually, I was my upper body was too forward and my leg was not in an angle. So in that case, I had back pain and the speed wasn't uh, fast enough. So in I just went to the gym and in my gym, there's about 10 steps I can run. Or sprinting or whatever I actually go to the rain uh, go to the gym without a gun I just start sprinting and that's a really good exercise and also I video myself that when I actually run uh, there, there's different bent angle on my legs or something like that a lot of people actually I see have a struggle having their legs extended all the way so a lot of people actually run with a bent knees and if you when you jump, basically, if you don't extend your legs all the way, you won't jump high. If you try to jump with bent knees, you're not going to jump high. So those kind of things, videoing and going to the gym and just trying to extend, jump high, those really yeah. help me. See, that's what I like. I just throw it to you, Kim. You go off for five minutes. Yes, yeah, so uh, <laughs> paying attention to those ideas has helped make me faster. Um, the, the big emphasis, like for me, is... I, I don't like, yes, I do leg exercises, plyometric type stuff. That stuff is nice. That's helpful for building agility. But the important thing is not going to be getting, getting faster, getting physically faster. Uh, you could do that, but that takes a long time and it doesn't help that much. What is important is deploying sort of all of the strength you have and all the speed you have. So I make a point of uh, sort of moving as aggressively as I can just for that short time that you need to be moving on a stage. Um, yes, I've, I've been emphasizing that my training. Yeah, I'm moving a little faster. Yes, it's it, yes, it's been helpful. And the stuff that Kim is talking about, those are, I mean, it gets detailed fast. Yes, you start working on that stuff and you get better. Okay, good. You nailed it, guys. Chris, yeah. anything to add or Matt, either of you? No. no. Don't feel obligated. I, if you nailed it. No, I mean, I'm in, I'm in the middle of doing that stuff. Like I've, I've played hockey most of my life, so I have good short explosive movement but transferring that from the ice to the range is a little bit different so i've got blades on my feet that i can stop real quick and change directions and stuff so 
yeah, the explosive movement parts there. Mine is just the stopping without sliding stuff that I'm working on. But yeah, I mean, it's I don't really think you can say it much better than what Wanzig just said. No. All right. On the last podcast, one of your guests said he preferred the Pocket Pro shot timer for dry practice, but there's no discussion on why. I'm about to buy one. Why Pocket Pro versus Pocket Pro 2, Pact, or CED 7000? Which one's a blue one? The, well, it could be Pocket Pro or Pocket, Pocket Pro, Pro 2. Yeah. The clearer one. Uh, I think that's the two. This is the one. It's boxier. The one is boxier. The two is a bit more rounded on the edges. I use a Pocket Pro 2. Okay. Why, why that one? Two. So, uh, no, I actually don't use either one of those. <laughs> What's the other one? What's the other it's... blue one? Chris, hold up. What do you have? This is just the standard Pocket Pro. And this is Pocket Pro 2? I don't have either one of those. I think I have a Pocket Pro, but it's not like a clear case. Oh, yeah. I know which one you're talking about. I've seen that before. It's like a translucent blue color. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, I think that's a. I think no, that's, that's a, a one. one. So it's a yeah. Pocket Pro 1. They made some in translucent blue. I have one. Okay. Yeah. That's what I got. That's what I use. Okay. I it, like the I like the Pocket Pro one. It keeps the time. It's and got that's part it. times. Yeah. Yes, uh, Pocket Pro one I like to change it from random to uh, like a random delay to instant is like a switch on the side. You don't have to do anything. Yeah. Um, you uh, it's really fast to change part times once you know how to do it, and it runs off nine volts, which is better I think because you don't have to remember to recharge it. You just throw a new throw a new battery in it. The Pocket Pro 2, what I like about that is it gives you a lot of display on the split time, so you can just see a lot of what's happening. But it's a little clunkier to change part times, in my opinion. That's the rundown on that. I would buy the Pocket Pro 1. I have like six of them. I think they're the shit. When, if I my timer ever goes bad and I can't fix it, I'm going to buy the 2. You do what you need to do, Matt. I'd buy the 1. <laughs> That's the one I like. Because it's hella fast. I like the split. You can see the splits and all that on it. Well, you can also see that on the one. It's just that the splits are better on the two. Yes, you do. You get to push more buttons. And Pocket Pro 2. Training. The, <laughs> there's a backlight on Pocket Pro 2. I don't give a shit about the backlight because I shoot when it's bright enough to see. <laughs> you don't like but, shooting in the dark? I'm, I like it just fine. I just don't do it. It's not like a thing that I do. Okay. <laughs> just saying. All right. Um, God, I guess another one for me. Ben, I took your class in Albuquerque. It was a great class. I highly recommend it to everyone. I learned several things from your class. The number, thing I, number one thing I learned, as stupid as this sounds, is I can really shoot much faster than I thought I could. I've been shooting PCC for, but that's one way to shoot faster. I've been shooting PCC for over a year now, and lately I've been getting trigger freeze really bad. It happens most often when I'm shooting the last target of an array before moving on to the next shooting box. I freeze on the second shot of the last target. God, shooting PCC in boxes? Fuck me. Anyway, the shot never goes off. My finger is pinned to the back. It really upsets my stage because uh, I'm already moving when it happens and I have to back up reposition to take one shot. Live fire, I know, but what other drills or tricks do you have to stop this trigger freeze? Anybody have any ideas? Because I have a pretty good one. Yeah, my initial thought was having the finger uh, coming out of the trigger way more than he think he should do. That's one way. All right. I'm thinking he's uh, – a lot of times people, when they try to go fast, they uh, conflate uh, speed with tension, especially in their hand that's doing the firing. So uh, he's in a hurry, like on a stage, trying to get out of position and trying to, to you know jam up that last target and slam a couple hits into it, tenses up his firing hand and gets that trigger freeze. The solution, of course, is to not do that, but the uh, challenging part would be – uh, shooting quickly without uh, over tensing his firing hand and getting the trigger freeze. So for his dry fire exercises, I would encourage you to pull the trigger fast and hard in dry fire, especially push yourself to go really fast, but make sure you keep your firing hand loose enough that you can actually function the trigger and you're resetting it all the way. So push yourself to go fast in your dry fire. You know, just don't over tense your hand and make sure that you're resetting the trigger. Try to recreate the problem in dry fire and then you'll be able to work through it. 
Okay, that's my take on it. Anyone else have anything to add? All right, I think that's no. enough questions for tonight. Uh, thank you, gentlemen, for joining me. Chris, Kim, and Mr. Matt, thank you so much. Listener people, if you have a question you'd like the answer to, go to bensteger.com. Send me your questions, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll address them you know, one at a time, or I'll make, make Kwanzaa answer them because he's better at that kind of thing. <laughs> okay, good.